All right, hi everyone. We are here today uh, to speak about uh, applications of AI for social good. Uh, my name is Bridget Goslink, and I'm the head of product impact for Google.org, which is Google's philanthropic arm. We give away funding, and we also look to leverage other uh, resources that we have across the company, our expertise, and our technology to drive social impact. I wanted to take a moment to, just before we get started, um, acknowledge the generational moment that we are in. Um, so just whatever you are feeling today, we are all feeling it too. My kids are running around in the backyard out my window. I am on a panel. I am trying to work. Um, and I'm also quite anxious about what's happening in our world and in our society, uh, particularly for those who are, are most vulnerable. And I think um, just want to pause and acknowledge that in this moment as we think about ways that we can all be helpful and, and hopefully uh, technology and the incredible tools and resources that we have um, across this great community can be a part of solutions both now and as we think about the uh, months and maybe years ahead of us as we recover. Um, with that, I would love to have my fellow panelists introduce themselves, and then I'll give a little bit of background on some of what we've been doing at Google on AI for Social Good, and then turn to the real experts, Gavin and Nithya, to speak a little bit about their work. Over to you all. Hi, uh, Alden Finn. Hi, everybody. This is Nithya Ramanathan. I'm the CEO and co-founder at NextLeaf Analytics. Um, NextLeaf builds sensor and IoT technology platforms in order to strengthen global health solutions and the delivery of life-saving equipment around the world. Um, thanks so much, Bridget, for that. And just also for Maya, just with even with everything that's happening right now, all of you participating chose to kind of go beyond and look at the global planet and continue to remain uh, curious about solutions that we can deliver. And so I'm personally just really honored and grateful to be sharing the stage with all of you in this community um, and grateful to fast forward as they've put in so much work in this. I mean, I think we've all started to learn more about what resilience looks like and, and this is absolutely what uh, resilience looks like. And we know that there's a lot more to do, but really grateful to be here. Thanks for saying that so well. I, I couldn't add anything to that. So I'll just say I'm Gavin McCormick. I'm a co-founder and executive director at WattTime. We write uh, environmental software. Uh, if you caught uh, Key Williams' talk, uh, I think of us as serum for renewable energy uh, or phrased otherwise, a surprising amount of renewable energy is thrown away because people don't know what time to use electricity uh, in order to run on clean energy instead of dirty energy. And so we write software that finds the clean kilowatt hours and replaces them. Uh, so you don't have to do things like uh, charge an electric vehicle on coal. Thank you both so much. So I wanted to, as I said, just say a few words about what we've been doing at Google and just generally what we've been seeing in the sector. And as AI is transforming everything around us in our world, we see it in our own products at Google, we see it in a lot of the products and services that we all use in our day-to-day -day lives. What more could we be doing to think about how the same technology could be applicable in the social sector? How might we ensure that organizations who are really already working on the front lines of change and using technology, you know, in many cases themselves, be applying this new cutting edge uh, emergent technology as well. And so with that in intent, we launched this Google AI Impact Challenge in the fall of 2018 with really no idea what the response would be. You know, we obviously sit around at Google talking about artificial intelligence all the time, and we had no idea whether everyone else was doing that or was going to think we were crazy for putting this call out. Uh, we got 2,600 submissions from 119 countries, which I think very much answered our question that we were not alone in thinking about the benefits of AI and how it could be used in, in our society to further uh, goals that we have. And um, from that, we selected 20 organizations to receive grants, which we'll speak a little bit about in a moment. Um, both Nithi and Gavin were recipients of that. But we also did analysis of the 2,600 submissions to really use it as an opportunity, frankly, to think about what the social sector you know, sort of view of, um, of artificial intelligence was and, and where there are opportunities. 
we published a report on that, um, which you can access on our website if you want to really dig into the details. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things at a high level, and, and we'll get to various insights from that report through this conversation. I think one of the most important ones for me was just realizing how much more accessible AI is than we really think it maybe uh, is at first blush. So 70% of the organizations who applied were planning to you know, use some off the shelf frameworks or tools. So these are readily available open source tools that have been built by you know, many of the large tech companies, but also others around the sector, uh, the tech sector, and often can be used relatively quickly off the shelf. So these are um, you know, things like our AutoML or you know, tools where you can really take a data set, bolt on a little you know, machine learning uh, algorithm, and as a result, get some sort of um, output, right? So you can put in an image recognition or put in an image data set, use an image recognition tool that can tell you whether something you know, is a cat or a tiger and give you a sense of, um, of what's in your data without actually doing a lot of machine learning building yourself. And I think that was a really, um, it is an important part of where we are in the arc of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning development that is starting to really, I think, be a meaningful tool and a set of uh, factors for the social sector. And 40% of our applicants actually were not using machine learning at all um, in their current work, which I think was also an important learning for us. So we were excited that people despite that, still wanted to apply, right? We were worried that we were just gonna get a bunch of AI researchers who are already doing this work and wanted to have a little bit more support for it. And I think actually Gavin and Mithy are both examples across the board of those things um, in the work that they're doing. And they are, of course, really the experts here to, to speak about how they've been applying AI for social good in their own work. Um, so as I mentioned, we have 20 organizations we've been supporting after this Google AI Impact Challenge um, call, uh, we've supported them with $25 million in funding, but also with expertise and mentoring, um, which I think is really critical and, and something that any technology company, big or small, can think about doing in this emerging field, that a little bit of time from someone who is truly expert, I think can be very valuable. And we found that to be the case um, across the board of the organizations we've been working with. So I would love to turn to each of you to share um, a bit more about what it is specifically that you've been using uh, or exploring the use of AI for in your organization. Um, so Gavin, why don't we start with you? Sure, so we work in environment, um, which often these days people think is synonymous with climate change, but I'd also sort of mention air pollution, less appreciated issue, but currently kills about 4 million people a year. So it's a very, very serious issue primarily affects the world's most vulnerable populations. And those two issues, both, the primary driver of them is power plants. So globally, it's actually therefore quite surprising that we have very little data on pollution from power plants, the biggest driver of arguably the two most important environmental issues. So the United States EPA has really good monitoring of uh, pollution from our power plants, and a couple of other countries do. But we wanted to use AI to tackle the problem what about all of the other countries in the world? What about all of the places in the world where some of the worst pollution is happening and we don't really have any data on that pollution? So it's really hard to do anything from writing advanced software to even doing basic things like catching illegal polluters. So what we realized is that we can use AI by um, taking advantage of the fact there's a surprising amount of public satellite data now available through things like Google Earth Engine. You can get pretty good imagery of all the power plants in the world uh, and so we use an AI-based solution to look at pictures of power plants, figure out when there's clouds of steam or smoke or an infrared, figure out when they're hot, and run that all into a computation engine that figures out how much energy and how much pollution is coming out of each power plant at each time, develop a global data set in near real time of all the pollution in the world coming out of every power plant in every country. And then we put that in the hands of different environmental groups. Yeah, and I think the, um, so just to name it, because I think we're all, you know, figuring out what we mean when we say artificial intelligence, what we mean by machine learning. So the actual tools that Gavin's using are mostly in the image recognition category, right, Gavin? So you're looking at, you're taking large amounts of satellite imagery and processing them and using image recognition to try to interpolate from that what is happening in the power plant. 
Absolutely. There. I was want to walk through it differently? <laughs> machine learning and start saying computer vision, for example. <laughs> I don't know if you're in something similar, Nithya. Uh, actually, if you don't mind, Bridget, I, I have a quick question. Gavin, how are you guys thinking about false positives? Because that's obviously always a huge issue. And when you're talking about image recognition for air pollution versus clouds, for example, or a jet stream, um, how are you starting to even think about false positives and, and validating that? Yeah. Um, so because what we're doing is not just sort of saying, is there pollution? We're saying how much, uh, what our version of a false positive looks like is going too high instead of too low. Sure. And so we thought really carefully about what happens if we get a false positive. And one of the use cases we were really worried about is um, if uh, we're looking at some uh, countries and other countries and we had some kind of systematic bias that would give us a false positive uh, consistently if the same power plants in the same country were consistently getting red oh. doing too much pollution. Oh. That's a serious problem. Whereas mm -hmm. we say on October 4th at 4 p.m. there was a briefly higher pollution than there really was, mm -hmm. less of a serious problem. So mm -hmm. we really have thought about how do we how do we tie it directly to who would get hurt by a false positive? What is the impact that actually happens from different results? And we've really tuned our um, our algorithms to try to make sure that we are uh, never having false positives in situations where it would actually affect somebody's life. Mm -hmm. I, right. I have to ask you how you think about false positives. Well, after you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. So I'll I'll jump in then. Uh, so next, leaf, one of the areas that we look at is vaccines. So as we are all now only too familiar, vaccines are vital to global health and massive efforts go towards just ensuring that uh, a vaccine reaches every single child out there. So part of the complexity and what's not as well known is that um, each vial of vaccine actually needs to be kept at the right temperature. So too hot and the vaccine will actually lose its potency. What's really surprising is actually even too cold and vaccines can also lose their, their potency. So the technology that we've been developing over the last decade is to monitor the temperature at every health facility so that uh, devices can send alerts to nurses when temperatures get too hot or too cold. And then of course that data is aggregated over the internet in order to help ministries actually manage their global supply chains. And so our technology now connects uh, health facilities and refrigerators from over 15,000 health facilities across 23 countries. And these devices are protecting the vaccine supply for uh, one in 10 babies born on earth every year. But the more that we started working with countries, what we found is, is that just getting an individual isolated picture into one clinic, uh, even if it was all the clinics across the country, wasn't enough, that the global supply chain was so interconnected and that the workforce and actually the power supply and grid power availability and the transportation and the trucks and the motorcycles, all of it was uh, inter interconnected and that countries really wanted a integrated total picture of the health of their supply chain. And so when we applied to the Google AI Impact Challenge, it was actually to develop a computational metric that would give countries a more integrated uh, picture of where they needed to focus, where were the vaccines most at risk. So studies show that 40 to 70 percent of vaccines are actually exposed to dangerously freezing temperatures but ministries didn't have that integrated picture of where most of these vaccines were at risk but these failures are incredibly costly for countries so it's been a really uh, big unmet need for ministries and the global sector in order to really get that full picture of a country's supply chain so what we are embarking on is developing a computational metric that will really help countries improve the efficiency of their supply chain. And as a starting point, what we found um, through deep dives with Google engineers um, and the uh, intensive resources that Google's made available, as well, as well as kind of bringing our Ministry of Health partners to the table, is that rather than getting the most accurate metric, what was most important was getting the most understandable metric um, as a starting point. And so we're actually starting with a World Health Organizational uh, World Health Organization model and uh, more straightforward computations in order to get that first pass estimate 
of vaccine potency and the vaccines that are actually at risk uh, across uh, the supply chain. And then as we work with governments, we get more data. We're thinking about a number of ways where machine learning uh, and in part computer vision will be helpful. So one of those is just taking images of vaccines um, and being able to then um, estimate what is the essentially the particle size, which will give you an estimate of the immunogenicity of the vaccines. And then, of course, as we get more data from tens of thousands of refrigerators, being able to predict failures based on region, model, um, other external conditions is, is going to be absolutely a next step. I think you're naming there something that's really important that we also saw across the board in both the broad pool of applications and, and I think are living through with many of our um, grantee organizations and partners now, which is, you know, figuring out when to, you know, use machine learning and when something else is actually just a better answer. Uh, and it actually feel, we feel pretty strongly that it's clear that machine learning is definitely not always the right answer. In fact, probably most of the time, it's not the right answer more often than not, um, both because it, you know, has a higher degree of complexity, uh, requires more resources to implement. And we saw both kind of the ends of the spectrum in our application pool. And I think even in ongoing conversations, right? Oh, one set of folks overestimating what machine learning can do. So, you know, I think yet not yet actually magic, something that we should remember despite its incredible uh, advances in the last few years. Or, you know, a place where actually maybe a more simple uh, model would be a better fit and get you pretty close in terms of your um, potential results. And I think, Nithya, the work that you all have done to really think about what's the right order of operations, how far can you get with a simpler, straightforward computational model. So what I mean by that is, you know, math that would be very understood by, you know, a basic mathematician um, or someone who can um, really understand where we understand the inputs, we understand the calculation, and we can really say, okay, the outputs came from this. We can understand how those variables are manipulated which is not always the case in a machine learning model. Um, so I would love both of you are working on uh, data sets and outputs for which explainability is a big factor. And you know, we often, I think, talk about explainability in kind of an abstract in machine learning uh, conversations. So people will be like, well, really, what about the explainability? Or what about the bias? And what about the you know, data uh, analysis, and you're sort of like, but those things actually don't mean anything on their own. So I would love for us, you know, over the course of this, we'll get to some of those other questions as well. But um, as you've been thinking about that trade-off around explainability, being able to share with folks what you're doing, Nithi, I think you just alluded to it a bit in your remarks. So maybe we'll start with you uh, in terms of the decision to go with more of a straightforward model now and layer on AI um, as you go forward. Yeah, thanks for that, Bridget. Um, yeah, for me, explainability um, kind of was at the core of everything that we were doing. Um, and we and actually, it was even during my PhD thesis, um, a core part of it was around explainability um, as, as I was developing algorithms for fault detection back then. Uh, so um, it was very much in our DNA. It was really interesting to us to realize how what we had been learning um, around explainability was so um, immediately mappable by the Google engineering teams as well. So they really helped us kind of think about the language around that and also how to ask those questions of ministries of health. Um, and sort of together, we what we focused on was, okay, what are the actions that the ministries of health want to take? And what are the barriers to those actions? And one of the things that we've been learning is that for ministries of health, often it's less about having the exact right answer and more about being able to explain why they're taking or why they want to be taking the actions that they're taking because ministries of health are very interconnected. And so one technician may be sitting in front of a fridge and saying, no, I am staring at this fridge. The compressor is literally not working, but still needs to be able to explain that to his or her boss. Um, and so that explainability is just so critical so that everybody's looking at the same blueprint and really understands exactly, as you were saying, Bridget, kind of the more straightforward computational mechanisms for how we got to that answer. And so that's where when when we kind of had the breakthrough 
again with the Google team, okay, why don't we look elsewhere? Why don't we start to explore where else we can find a more explainable but still credible metric um, finding the um, existing kind of computational models that were more straightforward, more linear, um, was was a really critical breakthrough that kind of allowed us to move to the next stage. What was then really exciting was it actually then opened up a lot of creativity for the team. And it was actually, I think, a suggestion from the Google team, otherwise certainly in discussion with the Google team, that the idea, for example, just saying, hey, why don't we call it, I think they they came up with the name like Shaco Meter, but it was essentially like, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe the naming needs some work, but but the idea was just that, you know, the critical thing is if you want to help a healthcare worker really figure out whether or not to administer this vaccine, being able to then bring in the computer vision and uh, other types of machine learning, that it kind of freed us up to then really think, okay, where is machine learning going to be most important? And so we're pretty excited about that as well. That's great, Gavin. I think you all have been going through a bit of a similar journey uh, and thinking about, especially because policymakers are, again, a user of your end outputs, how you think about needing to be able to explain to them where your calculations are coming from on something like a power plant emissions model. Totally. So I would say I come out of academia and I'm so used to thinking about explaining ability as like window dressing. Like first you get all the data and you figure out all the answers and then you figure out how am I going to explain this to people? And I think it really helped us to say like, look, if impact is the point and you have the right answer and nobody listens, it doesn't matter. And so um, we've really gone from the ground up trying to integrate explainability from the beginning. And I think we learned a really similar lesson. In, in our case, we actually ended up with two completely distinct models. One AI model that is more accurate for a few really sophisticated users who really, really care about the precisely right answer. And one model that's actually not AI based, but was kind of informed by what we learned from the AI model. Uh, that's real concrete and it's things like, okay, we can see you burned seven tons of coal and each ton of coal is this much pollution. So you're about that much pollution. People really get that. Um, and so it was literally worth having two different tech stacks that only a little bit interact, um, given how important that was to make sure it's really used. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, part of that too, and and I, I think one of the things we are talking about a lot is, you know, we need to be I think leaning into ways where we think AI can be really beneficial, uh, because if we don't, we'll potentially miss things that were literally otherwise not possible, right? You could not literally do what you're doing in either of your instances, right? You could not go to every power plant and install a sensor everywhere in the world in the same way that you might be able to here. Um, and so I think you know we need to keep keep focused on that potential benefit. And at the same time, being clear-eyed about some of these risks, whether they're around explainability and, and potential non-action or around bias and you know, some of the ways that we know we need to be thinking about, um, about bias. I think often the bias conversation can be feel very uh, almost one-dimensional, right? We think a lot about humans and, um, and necessarily so, particularly when we're thinking about data sets that you know, are overrepresented of, of more vulnerable or marginalized groups. But it actually, I think, manifests in a lot of different ways that um, that you may not even know going into uh, a problem or that you're working on. And so finding the right ways to check for potential bias or uh, potential ways in which your data may or may not be representative of the sort of full picture, whatever that picture is, <clears throat> is really critical. And I would love for each of you to, we've really been seeing this a lot. We saw this in the applications that people really wanted to be leaning in on responsibility. This is a group of, you know, sort of the society that, that does obviously think a lot about that. And I think have wrestled through it with a lot of the different organizations we've been supporting of, you know, what questions you need to be asking when, what are the tools you're using to actually do that analysis? So I would love to have each of you speak a little bit about what that's looked like for you. Uh, and maybe Gavin, we can just pick up with where you were kind of leaving off because I think it's related to some of what you were articulating around explainability as well. Um, sure. So I think uh, I just think you said that really well. I, so much of the conversation around bias has been the hugely important issue of human bias that we, I think, started a little bit naive thinking, oh, great, like we don't look at humans. Surely bias isn't relevant for us. And what we learned is it's totally not right. Um, <laughs> so a good example of the kind of bias that we realized we'd get burned by um, if we are overestimating power plants that have uh, flu stacks and we are underestimating the pollution uh, of power plants that have boilers uh, or if we're overestimating coal or underestimating gas, you would think that this is not an issue that we really need to be concerned about bias in the same way. 
But it turns out that some of these patterns are systematically more common in, for example, low income countries than high income countries. And we realized, wait, if we're systematically overestimating one type of pollution over another, we are going to have, uh, we're going to be contributing to the already crisis in the climate that there's a lot of distrust between uh, richer and poorer countries. And we're going to be having systematic problems that way. And then we also realized that if we, if we did things like if we overestimate coal or gas, we might be writing the wrong policy prescriptions. It might be implying to scientists and policymakers that they should take one action when that's just not right. So we really started thinking about bias should needs to permeate everything we do if impact is the goal. And all throughout the, the chain, we need to be thinking about um, how is our relative precision in different categories. So it's actually, it's front center to everything we do. Nithya, anything you wanna add from your perspective? Uh, only a little bit. I love that, Gavin. I, as usual, I'm I'm learning a lot just hearing about how you think about these things, and I, I'm gonna have to circle back with you on that because I think that's that's really fascinating. On a related note, what that brings up for me is we have been talking a lot with not only WHO and countries, but also Gabby. Um, Gabby is the the main uh, kind of agency uh, that manages uh, vaccine disbursements and will be investing $15 billion over the next 10 years to help countries distribute vaccines. And for them, Gabby thinks a lot about equity. And so one of their concerns was that when you take a computational metric and if you sort of reduce the entire performance of a supply chain to a single computational metric, and in this case, the metric is based on the value of the vaccines that are at risk. Their worry is that like with any optimization problem, you could optimize for the wrong thing. And so if you take the single metric and you optimize for minimizing uh, the value of vaccines at risk, uh, and sorry, I'm gonna try not to get too uh, engineering wonky, but, but just that anything uh, if you're trying to minimize an optimization factor, you can optimize it to zero. And so the way to optimize value of vaccines at risk is by not distributing vaccines at all. Um, and so if you have the most value of vaccines at risk in the most remote regions, which intuitively is probably going to be the case, well, the fastest way to minimize that metric is to stop distributing vaccines to the most marginalized community. So um, there's absolutely, uh, you know, I think an analogy here that I, I think we could probably really learn um, from you all, Gavin, about how you're thinking about it. But just, you know, in development, our approach to that so far has just been full. So along with explainability, um, a core part of explainability is transparency, um, readability. And so what we're trying to do is think a lot about as you develop this metric, how do you make not only just the assumptions, but some of these trade-offs more visible um, to ministries. So one really, I, I are you probably a dumb idea right now, but I'm sure we'll get better as we talk with more countries, is just having not only the metric be visible, but also just the populations that are affected also be made visible through the dashboard so that you can start to really think about an integrated picture. Um, but yeah, this this stuff is really hard to, to discuss. But what has been really interesting to me is that this notion of bias even if you know Ministry of Health wouldn't call it bias, is absolutely intermittent in all of this, or sorry, built in and integrated. I meant to say in all of this, intermittent bias also also fine, <laughs> <laughs> also likely happening. But, well, I know we have relatively limited time, but I do want to speak to another point that I think has been really um, critical for for success for each of you, and also to help just again bring to life what does it take to be successful in applying AI in this social sector context as we all are pro, pro, still pretty early days and I think unlocking this opportunity. And that's really around what kind of team does it take? So one of the things that I think uh, everyone should know and that we have been trying to um, sort of dispel the myth on is, you know, it's very, very unlikely that you need sort of a cutting edge machine learning researcher to be doing this type of work at this stage, just because so much is readily available kind of off the shelf. Um, and there are a lot of existing tools and frameworks that you can be building on. You sort of that foundation in some ways is already available. But I would love for each of you to articulate sort of what you feel has been, is necessary in your teams to do this work. And, and in that, I think there's kind of this inherent piece that the machine learning is only one tiny portion in many ways of the work, right? It's a it's solving a particular challenge, but then ensuring that you this work has impact obviously requires both your own teams to have diversity 
as well as, and you've already articulated in both cases, really significant partnerships, um, which is something we also saw as really driving impact for a lot of these projects so that they're not just you know, research exercises, but really um, actually changing something out in the real world. I know for us, that sounds very relevant. So I would say the deeper I get into impact, the more I feel like it's a team sport. Um, and it's just been really, really interesting seeing that uh, with so many of these tools really becoming something that you can have one person having massive impact. Um, the more we want to think both in terms of diverse team on the team. So for example, uh, we really needed somebody who understands the, the details of the chemistry. Uh, and we really needed somebody who's handling the fact that some of our input data had errors in it. And we really needed somebody who's really good at talking to governments. And actually the, the AI researchers portion of our team was a really, really small share. And then I just can't, I can't emphasize enough how much like um, other organizations have been really helpful. So uh, if we spot somebody who could be raising awareness, maybe we should lob that over to Greenpeace. If we spot some illegal polluters, maybe we need to call Earth Justice. And, and the idea that AI can sort of amplify within a team, but also like a movement of many collaborating organizations has been really eye-opening for me. Yeah, really similar for us. So our team it consists of epidemiologists, data scientists, engineers, uh, people with expertise uh, working with governments and countries, uh, finance folks. Uh, it's really it it runs the entire gamut, and I think that's part of what in in our world makes us so different. Um, in the sort of vaccine global health space, um, teams tend to be a little bit more homogenous. So the fact that we kind of realized early on that we had to bring on uh, people from all of these backgrounds has been, I think, really critical to the kinds of scale that we've also been able to have. What's also been interesting to me is how important that diversity is on the Ministry of Health side. So we've started looking at, okay, when we are working with Ministries of Health, let's actually help the Ministry of Health go over to their neighbors and talk to the Ministry of IT. Let's help the Ministry of Health go to their neighbors on the other side and talk to the Ministry of Finance. But you would be shocked. I remember um, speaking with Dr. Ngozi, who was the former Ministry of Finance for Nigeria, Minister of Finance for Nigeria, and she talked about how she never got to talk with the Minister of Health. I mean, that just sounds crazy to me, but in silos and organizations happen everywhere. So that's been critical, actually, not only bringing our own diversity, but then encouraging our customers and partners to really leverage their own diversity and start to, now we've started embedding data people inside the Ministry of Health so that they can start to bring that diversity of, of thinking as well. It's It's been really effective that way. Thanks for connecting the dots, Vithya, on the government side. <laughs> always always a, a joy to be thinking about all the um, potential could be there. Listen, I think, I mean, I can definitely speak for the three of us and say we could keep talking about this forever. Um, <laughs> but I know we have to have to wrap. Um, I want to just leave folks with maybe just a couple of, of thoughts on where this is to just reinforce that this is still, I think, so early in, what, in this conversation in terms of where we as Google are thinking about taking this work, where any of um, our partners are thinking about taking the work. And frankly, I think for all of us to be really understanding where AI is appropriate as a solution, where it's not, uh, and really actually just a distraction. Um, what we can be doing to further unlock tools, lower barriers to use and, and access. And I think would really welcome, you know, continued conversation um, with all of you and across the board on how we can really be using these kind of cutting edge tools in the best possible ways. Because when we do, and when we do it in, um, in a way that is going to be sort of implemented correctly to, to these points on what it takes to really drive to impact. I truly believe we will see change on some of our most intractable issues that we literally could not fathom being possible even just a couple of years ago. So with that, thank you so much, Gavin, Nithya, literally always just such a pleasure to speak with you and learn from you. Um, and most importantly, thanks for all the critical work you're doing on two of our most pressing issues around the world these days. Likewise, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, thanks, thanks for joining. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.